there's an exhibition that this panel is about, which is Clay Holds Water, Water Holds Memory at the CAC, the Contemporary Arts Center. It's an exhibition of 19 black women and non-binary artists, different generations and different ways of making all sorts of diversity of narratives and perspectives. I'm going to start with Yinka Orefedia. In a fractured world where loneliness and isolation run rampant, I find even a momentary sense of unity to be invaluable. I was in a conversation with Osa Atoi, who started the Cabo Clay Collective. And we were talking about how she had started Cabo to create a sense of community and a sense of connectedness and a place that we could all share ideas and even start projects together and support each other around those projects. So in finding her through Cabo, we had a conversation about an exhibition like this that would pull together different voices of black people in ceramics. And I specifically wanted to focus on women and non-binary artists. I felt that there was, in my history, from being an undergrad all the way up to where I am now, really hard to find resources. I would have to really look really hard to find those in some of the areas that I was in, and often finding myself as the only person of color in a a lot of spaces. I know that through Cabo and things like this exhibition that I can make connections between our work and where we've come from, our mentors like Sana and our emerging artists like Chelsea and a new artist that I've just discovered through Cabo like Isissa here. Nakia Johnson she gave the title, Clay Holds Water, Water Holds Memory, and it was a whisper of clay to an artist in her studio. I found that quote of hers, and I was like, that has to be the title. And as a part of this idea of a collaboration, of pulling together the voices of the artists in the show. Lydia Thompson, her work explores a person's relationship to the culture in which they find themselves while retaining their identity, partly through their taught traditions and ancestors. Sid Carpenter sculpts with clay to tell stories of African-American culture, U.S. history, legacy, and courage. Osa Atoi, referencing historical forms, she says, I add myself to the archaeological continuum. The process of colonization, geographical displacement, and globalization has left many of us without traditional practices. And then Yinka Orofidia, who I started the presentation with, Shay Burke, this is a quote from her, I am aware of the generations of ancestors who are there to support me when I am working with my hands. My fingers are their fingers. Through making, I can preserve what must be remembered. And I have um, Ashlyn Pope. Her material choices stem from the traditional works of her ancestors and the influences African art has had on these traditions. April Adewal's creative process is heavily influenced by time spent beside her great-grandmother at the quilting frame. She fabricates layers of stories in clay using personal symbols, color, and the scars of creation. Olu Ateri, whose work came from Nigeria. My work explores the self as a carrier of experience, needs, conditioning, and dreams. Lola Aisha Agbara. Situated at the intersections of blackness, queerness, and womanhood, I practice art visually and sonically through commemorative lens using the body form as well as the absence of the body to contemplate complexities of labor, desire, and longing as an ongoing search for due process. Victoria Walton explores the complexity of black identity centering on narratives of women and gender expansive people. Her work reveals how our environment builds and breaks us down while discovering ways to create space for subversion, emotional untethering, community, and contemplation. Joey Quinones. I use the figure of the topsy-turvy doll as a starting point to explore the internal contradictions of a queer Afro-Latinx identity. They consist of hybrid forms and memories, carefully alluding to what it means to be black, Puerto Rican, a citizen, female, and queer. Angela Drakeford, we are going to lose this world if we don't embrace radical change. We must agree to not make ourselves comfortable with the abundance of suffering found in this world. We need to push ourselves and those around us to be open to change because it is coming and now is the time to decide 
how we will respond to these crises. We cannot abandon people, nor can we pull away from the work of opening each other's eyes, hearts, and minds. Jotsani, Elaine Dean, encountering the various cultures, economies, and time periods connected to cotton continue to take through nonlinear timeline journeys from the past to the present. These diverse and interconnected histories permeate the work I make. This quote from Ann Adams is really an important one to me. I had said from the beginning of my work in ceramics that I wanted to be a part of a movement where there is representation of ceramics created by Africans in free and loved spaces, not displayed as stolen artifacts in museums around the world, but as a symbol of power, acceptance and inclusion of ourselves and our history. Chelsea McMaster is a ceramic artist of Afro-Caribbean descent. She completed her BA at Millersville University, PA in 2019. In 2023, she was awarded the Ensika Graduate Student Fellowship. Now based in New York State, she is in her first year of graduate study at Alfred University. Chelsea primarily uses coil building and sculpting techniques with low fire clay and traditional finishes. Her work seeks to find ways to represent her culture and traditions. I'm very, very proud to be working with Chelsea at Alfred and have her here in this panel. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Isissa Kamada John, Afro Caribbean artist and designer, raised in Brooklyn and Queens, New York, working primarily in clay and on paper. Her work explores hybridity and the in-between. Her functional and sculptural ritual vessels serve to encourage contemplative practice and support personal and collective liberation. Isissa is a recipient of fellowships from the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts, Multicultural Fellowship, Aramont School of the Arts and Crafts, Wingate University Fellowship, and the Color Network. She has been awarded grants and scholarships from Artist Literacies Institute and the Penland School of Craft. She was a 2022 recipient of Township 10 and is an incoming 2023 artist in residence at uh, LA. In the past, Isissa served as the exhibitions manager and designer for the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem and as an exhibitions director of the Museum of Contemporary African Diasporan Arts in Brooklyn. She holds an AB in Africana Studies from Brown University. Isissa enjoys practices that support presence and healing and has been a student of the Buddha Rama for over 10 years. She currently makes her home at Moon Mountain, a budding land collective on unceded Cherokee land in the mountain of Western North Carolina. And finally, Sana Musasama received her BA from City College of New York in 1973 and her MFA from Alfred University, New York in 1988. She was awarded the 2022 Life Honorary Membership Award and the 2018 Outstanding Achievement Award from the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts for her years of teaching and her humanitarian work with victims of sex trafficking in Cambodia and the United States. Sana is the coordinator of the Apron Project, a sustainable entrepreneurial project for girls and young women who reintegrate into society after being forced into sex trafficking. In 2016, she was a guest speaker on activism through art at ROCA, or R-O-C-A, a recently published article by Cliff Hawker, If I Can Help Somebody, Sana Musasana's Art of Healing, appears in International Review of African American Art. In 2015, the Museum of Art and Design in New York selected four works from the Unspeakable series for their private collection. Sana was awarded the ACLU of Michigan Art Prize 7 and Art Prize 8. In 2002, she was awarded Anonymous, was a woman. Sana was featured in the 2001 Florence Biennial. Her work is in multiple collections such as the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York, the Hood Museum of Art in Hanover, New Hampshire, the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, New York, Bluffton University in Bluffton, Ohio, and numerous private collections. Sana lives and works in New York, and I love her so deeply. She's been um, a mentor to me 
from afar as an undergraduate before I even knew her. And she continues to be a really powerful mechanism. Sid, Lydia, and Sana are the, really the heart and soul of this exhibition. And they pull us all, they lift us all with their work and what they've brought for us in this field. And many, many of us would not be on this stage if Sana, Lydia, and Sid, and the other women who have paved the way for us hadn't done the hard work that they've done. And I really, really want to thank them all. And this show is a representation of that. I couldn't include every single person whose voice should be in this show, but they are all there. And I hope that this kind of project can move forward and keep including more and more black women and non-binary artists. But I just wanted to read my poem. In the gaps will I know where to stand to breathe on her neck, on her back, together. If we break, release, breathe, she can hold us up. Together this tightening, this press, press it down more. Shave a bit off, a little here, a little there. She will fly. Mino Gigua Prunk flutters and flaps as to rise above a deep hurt of this moment and its past. Squirming and rhythmically, she detaches unapologetic for expecting things to be different right now. She grows a hundred wings made of the feathers of the collective voices, a healing, power enough to lift off. She will fly, weaving remnants tattered and mended. She knows something, it is something. It is here, we are here. Today I'm going to be talking about a research project that I've been working on. The name of the project is called Wadadli Folk, and it is a heritage pottery project that kind of began as a need for me to retroactively build a foundation for my work. After I realized that ceramics in the Caribbean existed, and then also has a really deep history. I felt empty by the fact that it was missing from my education. When I wanted to learn about clay in connection to my Antiguan heritage, I couldn't find a lot of the answers for the questions that I had. But what I did find was that the tradition of pottery making within the country was dying and it needed to be preserved. I want to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the entire region. Pottery in the Caribbean is vast and far reaching and it has influences from all corners of the world. That is reflected in the ceramics. So each island has a complex mixture of people and cultures. Ceramics can be used as a lens to examine that culture and also its influences. So a look at the contemporary landscape of clay kind of opens a portal into the histories of the region and how those histories and influences has evolved and changed, but they're all still very much alive in some form today. And specifically, my interest lies with the pots made by women of the African diaspora. So this is L.V. Stephen. This photo was taken in 1970, and it's quite an iconic one, and it's closely tied to clay on the island of Antigua. So when she officially opened her pottery studio, it was a way for her to cement a practice that had been passed down through her family for 200 years. She is only one of the traditional potters that you can find throughout the Caribbean region. And these makers have been working for centuries, and they're a testament to ceramics there and how it influences material culture. However, there is still little information available, like readily available for people outside of that region to know what's happening there. There is some current research that has been done. In the recent years, Creole clay is um, a book by Patricia Fay that was published in 2017, and Jamaican Ceramics by Norma Rodney Herrick that was published in 2022. So these books show an extensive research in tracking the history of pottery and the people who've been making them. And they're great texts for understanding ceramics in the English-speaking Caribbean. However, as an artist, I still have a lot of questions that are left unanswered. For this project, my area of focus is Sevia Farm Village in Antigua. That village was the main pottery production village on the island for many years. And so we'll be starting my research there. 
interviewing the remaining potters, talking to families and getting the histories from them and stories for as far back as I can find. And then we'll also be trying to revitalize that tradition as well. Two small points, but it is a huge task. Here are some examples of pots from the Caribbean. There are a bunch of pots from St. Lucia. And the one, the other image is um, some from Antigua. So these are like some of the forms that you can find that are pretty readily available if you go looking for them. I have questions like what other forms are being made? Like what are their names? How do they vary from island to island? And what are they used for? I want to know like what tools are being used? Where are these tools coming from? What are they called and why? Where is the clay found? How is the clay prepared? What type of clay is used? How are they fired? Understanding firing methods, like what are the practices? There's currently like no single place where all of this information is easily available. These are images from Edith Line. Um, she is one of the three remaining active potters in the village of Seaview Farm right now. What is the present day state of pottery in the village? How do we learn about the people who make and their histories and legacies within the tradition? And what do we have to do to ensure that these traditions continue? This is a mural from the village that is very prominently showing how closely the identity of the village is linked to ceramics and how that looked in the past. These are two of the main active potters. We have Hyacinth Hillhouse, who is the granddaughter of L.V. Stevens, and Edith Line. We'll start with research, um, getting stories, finding people, recording with second step documentation will like to do some outreach and education. One of the reasons why the tradition is dying, I mean, there's many reasons, but there just have not been any new people finding the craft or coming into it. So we want to reach out to high schools, find teachers, art teachers, kind of have them get it back into the school system because it was once a part of the school system but hat was like phased out. Find students who are interested and then also the final part would be to connect them to the active potters that are still working so that we can get some new blood into it and try as, as hard as we can to keep it going. This of course is a long-term project plan. It's something that is very important. These are two images of my own work. One of them is on display at the show at the CAC right now. With this project, one of the things that I want to do personally is to kind of bridge a gap between this tradition and where I am with my work it took me a very long time to find these women and to understand that this is a tradition that I could be a part of. After discovering them, I felt very disconnected because this village is a place that was a five minute drive from where I grew up and I had no idea that these women were there working. And it was after I moved here and listened to a talk at Nzika that it opened the possibilities for me to even start looking in the Caribbean for people who are working for inspiration for the histories, the stories. And in my own journey to like find this information, I want to make sure that it is documented and kept for the next person who has these questions. Research like this is very important and I hope I can not only complete the research, but implement some of these practices into my own work and begin to repair and foster a connection with this tradition in these women. Hi everyone, my name is Isissa and I'm grateful to each of you for being here this morning and to these brilliant folks that I get to be in conversation with today. Thank you to Adero for bringing us together and putting this show together. Thank you all so much. This is a blessing to be here. I'd like to share a little bit about my current work as an unfolding journey of claiming lineage and identity. And I'll also share about how my work shapes my spiritual and healing practices 
and how I got here. My background is in exhibition making. I've worked both in African diasporic contemporary art spaces and research institutions. For over a decade, I curated, organized, and designed exhibitions with a focus on racial justice, amplifying the voices of black artists, and community building through shared experiences of engaging with material culture, historical archives, and the ideas of artists. It was beautiful and energizing work to be in at that time. In 2016, the message came in loud that I needed to transition out of that work and evolve into centering my own studio and spiritual practice. It's been a journey of shifting away from sourcing knowledge from outside of myself and towards valuing my inner knowing. I didn't realize it fully when I made the change, but it was a healing path that I was signing up for. And I've had to let go of a lot of the frameworks for working and models for success that I was taught in the Ivy League and perpetuated. It brought me to living at meditation centers and retreating deeply to exploring alternative ways to live on land, in artistic community, and now to living rurally and working with others to build an intimate healing space in the mountains in North Carolina for inner exploration, creativity, balance, and connection. I'm deeply interested in ancestry, identity, and questions around who and what I come from. It's about locating myself in a broader lineage and being part of a collective power that spans time and space. It's about understanding my place in the world and what's mine to carry forward and create with this life. And as a queer, mixed race, black person, I've often found approaching lineage as a tracing of bloodlines and recorded histories, leaving me feeling fragmented, less than whole, and somehow not always fully part of what I'm learning about. I became fascinated with the idea that I have ancestors, both biological and otherwise kin, who were queer and black and straddled racial space in precisely the ways that I do. They're there somewhere, even if they weren't talked or written about. But since their lives, experiences, and inner worlds aren't the ones recorded in archives, I had to queer my methods and find ways of connecting with the community of folks who've come before me and lived in the in-between spaces. My practice sits at the intersection of art, craft, and collective healing. My process with clay is my process of communing with these real and imagined kinfolk. They're a crew of fierce, unapologetic, whimsical, and elegant beings who guide me in my work and are my work to manifest physically. My vessels connect me to a lineage of folks who've lived in the in-between realms, occupying a hybrid space of hypervisibility and invisibility at the same time. I see these ancestor vessels as trickster guardians of the liminal of the space where one thing ends and another begins. Change, transformation, death, creation, hope. In my work, I create vessel beings who can hold space for and honor these processes for us. They help us to be at home in the confusion of it all. And their complexity is their resilience. They advocate for the opportunity that always exists in the struggle. Practically, these vessels are functional and support healing and personal transformation through ritual use. I create vessels to grieve the death of old parts, support the courage to change, inspire acceptance, and access embodied wisdom. With each vessel or group, I offer an invitation for use from filling with water and speaking in prayers to blowing out secrets from tiny holes in the form. Series like Heal are designed to accompany us through major change over time, noting shifts along the way as we move and practice from one vessel to the next. For Your Tears is a friend to grieve with and catch and hold our sadness when it's too much inside. There to meditate with, keep on an altar, pray with, and invite into our most intimate internal processes. 
I see them as tools for us to access speculative, ancestral, and futuristic practices as they act as containers to hold us emotionally and spiritually. I'm interested in expanding notions of functional ceramic wear by advocating for our needs more fully beyond the mundane and physical. These objects are mostly wheel thrown and hand altered. I primarily work with mid fire stone wear and oxidation, and aesthetically they explore integrating opposites, ordered and chaotic, organic and geometric, bold and delicate, interior and exterior, simple and complex, saturated and light, masculine and feminine, ancient and new. My work is a strategy for healing from colonialism and internalized racism and capitalism so that we can thrive and shine. It stands in defiance of narratives of deficiency and the story that we're not enough as we are. I see each of us healing as our part in the collective movement for liberation, and I make work to support that healing process. It's an offering reflecting our wholeness. I'm intrigued by collaborations with people to develop containers for their specific needs and provide a tool to help through those challenging times when we need more holding, more container. Clay does such a beautiful job of holding space for us as physical beings, dinner bowls and bathtubs and water jugs, and it has potential to be an ally for so much more, and that's what I'm exploring. So this is my story. My childhood dining room table is where the impetus to explore the world was encouraged. My dad made a career of the military and his his stories of faraway places that were infused into my consciousness. Our Sunday dining room table was populated with my parents' friends from throughout the world. Different foods, dress, habits, systems, the different names of gods excited me and my four sisters. I never feared difference or otherness, but instead loved it. I live in St. Albans, Queens, the house that I grew up in. My community is 90% brown people. However, my formal education, I was often the only brown person sitting at the table. I was dominated by white spaces. It was never easy but I come from a rich tapestry of love stories, of resistance, power, and strength. And I bit the bullet, and I pushed through it. I also returned home every day to my wellspring and was refilled. I survived ignorant and racist comments, such as nigger lips, blackie, monkey face. How do you wash your hair? Can I touch it? Sana, do black people have full behinds because of incest? This is what I heard. My fourth grade teacher only gave me black crayons. My nieces, nephews, grandnieces choose not to enter white spaces. They are creating their own systems. They are rewriting their own narratives. I sought world travel as a way to expand my personal boundaries to go beyond the comfort zone of my world. Why didn't other people do that? Maybe in the beginning, it was an escape from my cultural climate of the 50s and 60s. In my travels as a woman and traveling solo, I go to markets. In markets, I will meet a woman who will have a daughter. Her daughter will become my guide and my language teacher. She'll also be my protector. Many times our roles change, and these little girls become my mommy. And in other roles, I become their mommy. All the time, we are sisters in our ritual of sisterhood. When I travel, I travel like the local people. I walk through lands, canoe through lands. I eat what local people eat. I make local friends. Often I stop and make pottery. Clay is all over the world. It comes in as many colors and personalities as we do. And I can stop and I can create. Little girls' lives I watch very, very, very closely. These are different parts of the world. Little girls are everywhere. In my experiences, poverty looks the same. 
wherever you find it. It's like a disease. It has no race. My ancestral family, girl soldiers. Most of the subject matter of my work in the last 15 years has been about the girls that have been in my life and the way that I've seen their lives be altered by war, famine. So these are the stories of girl soldiers. This young girl said to me, before I was trained to be a killer, I wanted to play sports. Sana, I was reaching for a ball when the rebels raided my village. I used to play with dolls. I died. The apron project I've been working on for 16 years, I read a story about a woman who was changing the narrative in her native country of Cambodia and also traveling around the world to make us aware of sex trafficking. Her name is Somali Mom. She would walk through the streets of Phnom Penh in the brothels that she was once trapped in and she would reach for girls. Once she would come in with water, medication, the women there would tell her where young girls were hidden, which would usually be in the planks of the floor. Somali would go back and rescue these girls. These four girls in the corner were the first girls that she rescued who died within a couple of weeks of being taken into the self-houses. I tell my students that you don't have to be a feminist or even a woman to protest violence. You just have to be human, something every one of us are in this room. I didn't go to Cambodia for two years because of the pandemic, and it broke my heart not being able to be around these girls. I promised them I would never abandon them. They were too young to know why Sana wasn't coming. But I did go back this year, and I was shocked to find out that the girls are younger and younger and younger. All of these girls were just recently rescued. This is a young girl who's being prepared to go to court and she's having tremendous anxiety and fear because she has to point to her trafficker. She's been coached for probably 18 months to two years, but still that day that she has to go, this is how she feels. I know all of us can look at her and feel what she's feeling. This is Somali hugging her, that she's safe, that we won't leave her there. The Apron Project. I met all of these girls 16 years ago. I still call them girls, but they're certainly young adults. They're now married with children. Sometimes I struggle with poverty level that I see every year and wonder whether my project is a good project or not. But I can say that I have hope that none of these girls' daughters will enter the sex industry. That's Ren Kim Pisa Ba. This is Somali with her team of workers. Every one of these girls are survivors. They've gone off to universities and they come back and they work for Somali. And this is a young girl that I met 16 years ago and she, we're laughing because she says you're short. What it is is she grew up. <laughs> I was always short. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we could open the floor to some questions. Um, the question I wanted to ask is to ask Sana, how can people contribute to your organization and buy these fabulous, because I have one, aprons, mm -hmm. so please tell folks how, how we can be a part of your mission. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. In many ways. For one, what people can do is just Google Somali Mom and donate to the foundation. Something is small. When I started doing it, I gave up coffee because I couldn't afford it. I don't, I'm an adjunct professor. I work five days a week, six jobs. I couldn't afford it, so I gave up coffee, and my coffee bill was $2 a day, $14. You multiply that four, and that's what I sent. And when I went there, I realized that that money put clean water in the shelter. So, 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 so simple. Even a dollar a day, the girls that you see that I work with, they, they're farmers. Their parents make a dollar a day, $30 a month. So it's so easy. Donate directly to the foundation. And then I'm Musa Samid Hotmail. Write me. And when I get it together, I'll put the aprons on, the, <laughs> on Etsy again. <laughs> And if any of you are in the New York, City, New York City area, you can always come and help me. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you see how I'm up here? Do <laughs> you see what's on the phone? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, St. Albans, Queens, but I think I'm from the whole place. <laughs> um, how long do you think the project will take? Chelsea's project is the question. Uh, a lifetime, I feel. <laughs> um, for now, I will be starting with um, a few weeks at the end of the semester, and then I'm hoping to be there for a year to see how much I can record, and then see where it goes from there. OK, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so we can open up the question of the title, which we've all thought, I think, I've thought a lot about, and we've talked to each other about clay holds water, water holds memory. It could be an aspect of that title or the title as a whole. Um, Isisa, would you like to start? And well, Chelsea's coming. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, it's interesting for me because a lot of the vessels I make are literally meant to like hold water as a vehicle for holding whatever it is that you're processing and working with in ritual or I'm processing and working with in ritual. So it's literally like the clay holding the water and the water holding the memory of the emotional or spiritual content that is at play. So if, when I heard the title of the show, I was like, oh, that's like literally what my work is for. And then I think more broadly, like about the way that water connects the diaspora, whether that's through like the movement across water in the transatlantic slave trade, and or if it's just this idea of like we may be like disparate spread throughout the world, but there's like this element of water, like this earth that can like hold us and create connection and like in working with clay, there's connection to that memory and that history and um, all of those who've come before and worked with clay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Sana, we were talking a little bit about healing, and yeah. I don't know, what are your thoughts on the title? Many, um, I, we talked yesterday that um, I have four sisters, and um, growing up, my mother ran water to calm us down when we were being disobedient. <laughs> And then also in the middle of the night when we would get up to go to the bathroom and we would be kicking and screaming because she woke us up to go and we'd sit on the toilet and refuse to go to the bathroom. She'd turn on water and we went immediately. <laughs> water is in our clay and that's what makes it so plastic and soft and able for us to move around. Our bodies are filled with water and I'm always thinking about the transatlantic and all that vast water that was beautiful but at the same time violent. Mm -hmm. We need to drink water. And I think about the water in the villages that I have lived in that was not clean and how people got sick and died. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, when I first started doing research into pots, I turned to my parents for stories about what pots were around them when they were younger. And there were two main pots, one of which which they called a jar pot, which was a water pot that was kept in the house. And it was made of red clay, fired really low so that it was still porous and it would keep the water cold. And that was how they had cold drinking water um, on a daily basis. And so when I started trying to make pots from the descriptions I was hearing, the stories I was finding, I started with a jar pot. And then I started putting the people who were holding those memories, those stories, onto the pots. So it all really comes full circle for me. I just wanted to say for me, this title of clay and water is about this flow between generations, um, identities, um, gender, and sexuality that we all share, and this like diversity, it has been really important to really speak to the diversity of, of, of the black women and non-binary artists in the show, and to make, to have that 
be really purposeful in the way that you know, water flows throughout many different environments through mountains and it, it's a strong force and a soft force that paves its way through different terrains. That's really what the artists are in the show represent. So thank you all for coming tonight.